so um, welcome to the workshop the international pragmatics workshop we've all introduced ourselves so now we are ready to begin with an initial set of lectures um, I uh, you already know you're in IIT Gandhinagar and so on so I begin with the question what is pragmatics which will be answered in different ways and it with, it with a lot of depth over the next few days and uh, but I take this definition from the IPRA 2019 uh, website uh, which and this conference is going to be held in Hong Kong and it says the field of linguistic pragmatics broadly conceived is the interdisciplinary a word which has come up many times um, cognitive social and cultural science of language use so you can see the keywords are already there use context interdisciplinarity so the first question we must ask is so what theories and methods do we use in pragmatics and why if at all are these research tools important in terms of the insights that they provide us so it's it's not clear okay now how's that is that better okay so uh, I have organized uh, my lecture in four sections one is preliminaries and actually I'm going to be spending quite a lot of time on this preliminary section and that is for a number of reasons one is as we've discussed India is very very diverse and so in order to pull it together I think we need to talk a little bit about the history and the geographical circumstances of the subcontinent which we inhabit so I'll spend almost half an hour on this section and then we will talk about research methods and Jenny will then take this forward um, and then about certain allied fields I know a lot of you are familiar with the term discourse analysis but per perhaps not uh, pra pragmatics so we'll try to connect discourse analysis to the field of pragmatics and finally I will talk about something I've tried to write on which is narrative and narrative cognition so those are the four sections and I'll begin with the first of these so um, the section one preliminaries and here I'm going to be talking about another subject which came up yesterday which was the notion of post-colonial India and why are we doing that partly because we know that the language of discourse in this classroom is English and that is strange when a lot of us are studying languages like Magadhi and um, all, all sorts of languages, um, uh, uh, um, Munda, so many, and yet our common link lang language in the universities in particular is English. So I would like to get the elephant in the room out there, and that elephant in the room is always the English language, and why we have to still keep it in mind today in the 21st century so I'll talk a bit about the history but I will focus on the language issues in particular uh, and the problem of English as a post-colonial language uh, as well as a global term um, now if all of if we think about English as a as a sort of nodal point one of the things we find is that a number of words come into our heads as soon as we talk about India and in the English language we many of these notions have come up I, is Bollywood familiar to everyone in this room okay and how about society class commun communalism communalism so I so this is just a small selection terrorism translation Western values Zanana you know you can have A to Z you can have a 
number of words which come cascading into your head the minute you mention language or discourse in India. And this is a very small selection, but we could be looking at hundreds of these words. So there we have a notion of cultural inclusion as well, which we have to uh, examine. Uh, I just want to show you some images. This is a typical post-colonial image. This is the Victoria um, memorial in Kolkata with a horse-drawn buggy and so on, but you still get replications of this. So this is the typical post-colonial image. Now if you look at the next one, this is an image which we have invented in the past um, sort of 20, maybe 30 years, which is the image of a shining, clean, technocratic India. We also have this image and only a couple of weeks ago, I read in the papers of sewer deaths in, uh, because of people going down these very dangerous manholes. So this is a picture of India which is caste-ridden, which is impoverished, which does not deal with its basic problems of inequality. And these are the images which are in people's minds in India and outside it. So we have the colonial image, we have the shining India image, and now we have this very shameful one as well. And we have the elephant and the cars on the streets of any capital in India. So these are what one might call stereotypes of India. And our job is partly to deconstruct these stereotypes, to understand what they may or may not signify uh, to different groups of people. And th these are very common ones, so let's see. Next. I'm so I want to move to the next image, and that's this one. And this is the only poster, the ad I'm going to use. It's from Kolkata, and I know we have participants from Kolkata. As you can see, spelling, the script systems, as well as directionality is indicated here. And you have Shakespeare spelled sexpure, which is very nice, and uh, Park Street which is, of course, a colonial street, and, or was, and then you have the police in the middle, so you have the power structures, and then you have jewelry, which in Bengal is quite important, goina, and um, the bookstore, and so you have here a system of signs which we need to decode, and they get more and more complex as they become more and more linguistic. So it's not just the elephant and the cars or Victoria Memorial, it's this kind of structure which we have to think about in more detail. And I'm picking out these images for you because they are, so to speak, images, visual images of the kind of structural complexity which we have to decode. Um, so Rushdie said, and you've all heard of Salman Rushdie, which is why I've selected him, said that, you know, India, a particular kind of India came into being after 1947. Um, and the India which came into being was based on these political ideals of secularism, democracy in the public sphere, sphere and socialism, socialism. But now he's saying today, for the past 20 or 30 years, the India which was envisioned then has transformed from the post-colonial, from the colonial structures. And so what we are inquiring into when we look at the history and geography of the subcontinent is really the structural changes which have occurred economically and politically, but also cognitively in the last few decades when we've had various types of revolution, including the IT revolution, economic liberalization. And all these, I believe, are marked linguistically as well. So we can look at the language structures. Um, so the role of theory. What is the role of theory in, in understanding processes of transformation, in understanding process? And um, 
can a pragmatics approach to post-colonial theory? So I'm writing a book now which is called Post-Colonial Pragmatics. And I'm trying to see whether you can use pragmatic methods, the details of pragmatic methods, to look at structures of post-coloniality and colonialism. So uh, can we use some of these tools to decode the religious, economic, political, and other structures, and what would these methodologies be? And uh, then, can these theories which we get from pragmatics, or these methods from pragmatics, and a combination of pragmatics and post-colonial theory, can they contribute to the language of the social sciences in general? So, uh, and how do such theories look at themselves. So as far as I'm concerned, for me, post-colonial theory is a branch of emancipatory theory, like Marxism, like gender studies, and so on, feminism. It is to liberate you from certain structures which you believe bound you. So I see emancipatory theories like post-colonialism in a different class from explanatory theories. And are you with me still? Yes. So, um, so what we are trying to do is to understand the nature of theory and method. But I'm going to do so in this first long section through understanding the languages of India and in particularly the role, the elite role which English plays in our university structure. So we know that English is a worldwide research language and a researcher who does not have English, somebody mentioned this the other day, is automatically seems to be deprivileged in the academic hierarchy. So already we have matters of inequality and power in institutional spaces uh, coming up here. And the naturalization of English as the language of research is something that we do face in India, but also elsewhere in the world. And you must be sort of be translated into English for your work to be significant in the public sphere or globally. And you, some of our researchers have relocated. So the part of it, part of our problem is to hold people here who are doing interesting and important research and to make them visible. Um, now, I want to mention to you that post-colonial studies, to my mind, came into being quite maybe 30 or 40 years ago, and they came about as the um, result of two very important books, which were published one after another. And one of those books was, so these are not pragmatics books, but in some ways those 80s were very important because um, uh, Said wrote Orientalism, which is a book all of you must read, in 1979. And this was quickly followed by Salman Rushdie's Midnight's Children. And that gave birth to, or an impetus anyway, to departments of post-colonial studies, where people studied these movements uh, academically and institutionalize them. So I think this moment was an important one. And so there are lots of theorists there. I have, um, so we can talk about some of these all the way down to Robert Young. And um, one of the things we have to say here is that if you go by post-colonial theories insights, and I'm not saying they're correct, that one way is that you are using neo-colonial resources to reinforce the colonial power of English. So th this makes English today a clone of its former self, and aspirations are still encoded within English, which is why I want to mention this, because all the journals we've mentioned are also English language journals, even if they are in India. So this is a problem. It's called a wicked problem by sociologists. You, there are no straightforward solutions, which is why we need interdisciplinary solutions. And how do we solve this problem? So uh, let me briefly go back to history. I want all of you, at least on this side, 
Some of you will know this poem. Do you know it? You know it, it's by Kamla Das. You may not know it. Um, it says, I am Indian, very brown, born in Malabar. I speak three languages right in two, dream in one. And for a long time, people bothered Kamla Das, who's a famous poet, uh, was a famous poet, um, about what language she dreamt in. And towards the end of her life, in an uh, interview, she said that the language she dreamt in was actually English. So that was a great irony, because she was writer in Malayalam, she was a famous poet, she was a gender icon, and yet she said the language she dealt, so we, uh, she dreamt in was in fact English. So we have to come up against this inheritance. So if we look at the language figures, something like Gradol, uh, English is spoken by let's say 20% of the population. But it is only used with ease by maybe 5% of the population. And that is one way of looking at English as an elite dominant language in, in, of institutional power and public power. The other way to look at it is to look at it as one of India's 800 odd languages. As you know, India has one sixth of the world's population. It also has one sixth of the world's languages. So this is important to note. So it is one amongst 800 odd languages. Those are some of the languages. Sorry? How many of the scheduled languages? Scheduled languages are about 20. Oh, mm -hmm. 22 now, but there were 16. So I just selected a middle. Can I yeah. 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 So, so, and the ones which are in bold are the languages with Guess what? what? There are some languages on this list which are on bold. Um, Assamese, for example. You don't know? So I'll just tell you, roughly, they are the languages with scripts. Yes, with different scripts. Uh, with different yes, scripts. Yes. And so having access to a script gave people access to statehood. So that was politically important. If you didn't have a script, even if you spoke a language which was spoken by millions of others, you still often did not get a state. So it is interesting that uh, all these political movements are marked also by linguistic movements. You, most of you know this. This map is one of my favorites. It compares a number of European countries to Indian, Indian, to the Indian uh, subcontinent, it shows the state, so it shows two Brazil's population, this is a population map. So Thailand, two Thailands, two Brazils, all sorts of countries all fit into the population map of India. So it is a very, we are talking about a subcontinent which is almost as densely populated linguistically as all of Western Europe and has more scripts. So it is something that we need to think about. This is a language map. We can come back to this. Um, we have four very major language groups. All of you know them. So um, I won't go into, but Australo-Asiatic, Tibeto-Burman, and of course, Aryan and Dravidian languages. So four major language groups. We haven't actually looked at whether these language typologies are borne out by stuff on the ground and whether what are the politics of language typologies. So those are the language maps. This is a script map. India, I, see, I believe, has more, language, more scripts than perhaps the rest of the world living scripts, like Gurmukhi and Urdu and so on, than the rest of the world put together. Yet we are not studying scripts in any serious way in India. So we need to look at how we can develop resources for the study of scripts. Co colonization was important because they alerted us to the fact that we had all this language richness. So in short, this was a British picture. This is many-armed multilingualism, many-headed, 
And Macaulay's reaction, you all know his minutes of 1835, um, talked about history abounding with kings 30 feet high and reigns 30,000 years long. Now, what's interesting about Macaulay was that Macaulay was a Greek scholar. And you know that Greek mythology has Pegasuses and all sorts of mythic beings. But Macaulay never made the mistake of saying the Greeks were not rational because they had all these legends. He did say about the Indian myths that they were literal. But of course, if you're studying metaphor, or you're studying irony, or you're studying narrative, you know that we can Myths are ways to illuminate structures on the ground. So this was a kind of colonial error, you could say, which became part of the argument for introducing English as the language of education. Um, so um, this is um, Jenny. I know you might have counter examples, and indeed I do. But I've looked at the archive quite carefully, and I looked at the archive from 17, um, around 1750 or maybe a bit earlier to right up to now, and I found lots of poetry written and uh, lots of dictionaries, which were very important for us because it enabled us to look at ourselves, but also things like to daftar khana atar. Thanks. The English language knows no thanks, owes no thanks, since office essence fish pond show, we need not words such so harsh and new. So this was a resistance to including Indian words inside the English lexicon, and it was an important resistance. Are you for, uh, do you for, you know, do stop me, even though I know we are recording, if you have questions. Are you with me? Okay. So, irony, 1857, all of you know this day? What was it, the date of? The first war of Indian independence, and Jeff has actually written how to look at these historical archives from a pragmatic perspective. Am I right, Jeff? Yes. So, it, that's why I introduced this one. But this was also the year when the first institutions where English was going to be the language of higher instruction in our universities. So, our universities were instituted. Instituted, not actually went off the ground, but instituted in 1857. So, you can see lots of dissonance there. Um, and I believe that when um, the British left India, and this is just a fun way of putting it, and no historian should will take me seriously here. I think they left us three gifts which are important for pragmatists. The first was the Indian bureaucracy and its language. I believe we should be all studying the files of the Indian bureaucracy because they are so complex and they are designed to keep you out not to give you information because they were colonial inventions. So, and the second is Pakistan. This is a word which every Indian knows if, if, even though they've never been to Pakistan, like I haven't been to Pakistan, but this is a word engraved in our hearts. And this was, of course, important, and I'll tell you why. And finally, we have English language. And I believe that if we are looking at post-colonial narratives, but also pragmatic methods to illuminate these narratives, we need to look at these three important tropes which were left to us. Um, okay. So, uh, so bureaucracy, we have bureaucracy. I won't be talking too much about this, but um, I have written books on it, so I guess. So that's a nice image of the Babu, whom you will recognize. And then today the Babu has changed, but has he changed all that much? And what, what is involved in this changing of image of the bureaucratic office in terms of meaning exchange? Um, then we have partition and the partition and Pakistan. And the reason I mention Pakistan and the partition is that you know every time I go to Europe these days or to America, I hear about immigration, and what a terrible thing it is. 
Eh, sorry? I said, but you never hear about it. This was the biggest exchange of people. It was 10 million and over a few months. And yet nobody has heard of this partition, excepting Indians. I believe that it is our job to be able to create these spaces where we are able to look at ourselves critically, certainly through the theories and methods of linguistics and other disciplines, but also that we are able to show that we have these amazing narratives and complexity of the exchange of partitions. This, so you see the partition pictures. And those were taken by an American, Heather Burke White, who accompanied Gandhi. And look at those images. So this is the breakdown of the library. Okay, so I've collected them from the Burke White archives. Um, and there's the vultures. This was oh, um, so mind-boggling. And yet, it is amazing that world history knows nothing of it. And why should world history, it's up to us, to try to understand this archive. So, um, we are looking for tools. Those are the wheels, and those are the people dead under the wheels. So, those are real pictures. So, this is not a film. Um, so, let's look at post-independence language policy impacted by the events of partition by Pakistan and Hindustan having to have the same language differently defined, Hindustani and Urdu, and uh, by all the... So when post-colonial uh, post -colonial language history unfolded, it did so with very strong ideologies, and the ideologies had to do with the resistance to having a monolithic idea of India, hence the linguistic states, hence the idea that languages and scripts were critical to our being. So what does this say? Oh, it says <coughs> official languages are two in number, if we look at our uh, constitutional papers, one of which is Hindi, and the other one of which is English. And it says, interestingly, that we will have a three-language formula, which all of you know about, so I won't spend time on that. It can come up. It's going away slowly. We need to monitor the three-language, the changes in the three-language formula. And fourth, we adopted English. But what is surprising to me, if you look at the Constitution, is 15 years. We thought in 15 years we could change over to our languages. Has that to our local languages? Has that happened? It has not happened, and it is not going to happen. So, in some ways, you know, we always say constitution is sacred to us; it's our political foundation. But it predicted things which were <laughs> clearly not uh, borne out by history. We need to ask, in our understanding of history, how we are to deploy current linguistic methods. Um, so, um, I hope I'm getting this right. So then we have Salman Rushdie talking about partition. He says, I have learned Pakistan in slices the same way as I have learned my growing sister. I first saw her at the age of zero, then three, four, six, 14, 18, 21. And so there have been many younger sisters for me to know. This is a metaphor, right? It's a metaphor for how we see other, the other, whether it's the British or the Pakistanis or anybody else, in terms of these slices, this discontinuous narrative, which is why I think narrative theory is. So he sees, he sees the world in a fragment of broken mirrors. So um, the English, of course, have we've already talked about. Um, now the post-colonial questions to which I think pragmatic theory can uh, uh, contribute is how can English break its cognitive shackles? It's a language which has had a very powerful history of domination. We all know that. 
but we all buy into the myth of the English language and I myself have benefited more than many people in this room from this education. So how to question it is very difficult for me, but I believe the languages of India of which English is one have to really, we have to have more powerful linguistic theories because so far we worked with the Chomskyan with the syntactic paradigm, which we have, we have a monolingual native speaker who constructs his language, but we don't have monolingual native speakers in contexts like India all that much. So I come to the last slide in this section on Angrezi and its impact. And this is, many people here are from UP, right? UP, this is the English goddess who was set up as a Dalit goddess in Banka village in UP. And you can see the American influence. She's like the Statue of Liberty holding up the fake. She's very much in the Western uh, um, mode, and yet she's a Dalit goddess. These are, and I think the great revolutions are going to come from um, uh, the great revolutions of cognition, of understanding, are going to come from the Dalits, from the women, from groups which must insert not only their own texts, but their theories of history into the traditional canon. So that's why I think the, these battles are ideological, they are in the public sphere, and even if we think of post-colonial theory as maybe passé, this is one area which we need to look at. And finally, we come to my students at the IIT. Again, I know there are lots of IITians here. And um, I mention this because they have developed their own genres of speech, which mark a departure from standard language practice. So uh, these are my articles. You know, I write books, so these are some of my books. But one of the first books I wrote was Technobrat. And I wrote it with all my students. So we all worked on computer screens, 20 of us. And uh, this guy said to me, I see that we are not good at talking, but we, in our labs, we forge a language of speech. And this seemed to me like Bruno Latour or something, but except it was being said by an IIT undergraduate about the work inside the lab and the kinds of language of the lab. So this is the technological um, uh, sort of intervention in the narrative of language. Um, so this is how they describe themselves. We don't have to go into this. Uh, Nehru set up or oh, was part of the political will in setting up the IITs. And he worried a lot about how it was that we were going to retain, we would have these premier technological institutes, but how would we retain imaginative power inside these? And he says, um, we, uh, uh, we can have industrial riches, but without tolerance, compassion, etc., these may well turn to dust and ashes. Now, these are idealistic thinkers, but I think we have space for ideology in the construction of uh, intellectual domains. So uh, he talked about always an imaginative uh, approach to engineering activity, and he said, look, you can measure beams, and you can measure houses, and you can construct buildings, as the director told you yesterday, yesterday uh, this morning. But how do you measure the strength of an individual? That is the job of, the, of universities in creating ethical environments. And it's a difficult task for us because we are so diverse. So, um, so now you look at the IIT languages. And if you look at it in linguistic terms, you have clippings, app, arbit, disco. You know these words? IIT wellers? Do you know them? No. So, application, arbit, famous term, it's arbitrariness, uh, funda, funde. So funda, funde is a Hindi plural ending attached to a root which is English. So there's a lot of transformation going on. I already, uh, so there's lots of these dosa, dean of student affairs, but dosa is also of course a food substance. 
and uh, so I've collected lots of them and hookah courses which are humanities and social sciences courses this is from a list of hundreds of terms okay so um, and uh, internet chat you can see there's a blending of languages two languages Hindi and English in um, uh, many, many, um, many internet conversations. So I'm not going to go, but I published this research in uh, Language in South Asia, which was edited, it's a CUP book, which was edited by Kachru in Illinois. Um, and of course, it, this is a very young population, so they're moving our languages forward. So these are new domains that we can look at, and they're old language processes which are going on in these new domains. So now we come to uh, the question of uh, pedagogy. We have English, we have language teaching, and we want to ask how do we negotiate relationships within the classroom? What do we do to make our pedagogy effective? And here, so we had language pedagogy and then we have all these disciplines like linguistics and linguistic pragmatics and so on. And traditionally the way we looked at language was we began with grammar, phonology, morphology, syntax, we taught sentence by sentence and we looked at structure. Then we came to the types of text, so they might be single sentence texts or corpora. Then we had notions of context like sociolinguistics and so on. Then we came to discourse and finally we came to a full fledged understanding of what pragmatics might be, which is a study of language with thick context. What I want to suggest is that we reverse this picture. We begin with pragmatics, uh, speech acts, um, conversational analysis, narrative and so on. That is we begin with use, we then look at communication, stylistics and so on, then look at social variation and taxonomies. I mean, I'm not saying that we do it in exactly this order, but I'm saying we reverse the structure where we looked at grammatical codes first and we look at use. This is not a new idea, but I've just used these arrows. And we come finally to grammatical structure and this way we learn as a child might without embarrassment. So, um, so instead of phonology, morphology, phonetics, whatever, we begin bottom up from the pragmatics. And uh, I'm going to be, so this would now lead to new professions and new directions in which we could take, the la to take language study. So for example, if we looked at language varieties, we could also look at legal language, at the language of advertising. One of you said you're studying advertising language. If you looked at corpora, you could look at areas like archiving, digital humanities, etc. So I think we also need to open up links between the classroom disciplines that we teach and the kind of real world impacts that they have in terms of, um, you know, uh, professions, etc. So, um, so one good measure of technological revolu revolutions, all technology, that they produce not only new inventions like the steam engine or whatever, but that they produce new styles of language. So printing press is said to have produced the novel. So now I'm going to give you a puzzle just to take a break. Two of these poems were written by a computer and two of them were written by real Japanese poets, they're haiku, three line stanzas, which was written by humans and computers, and I've tried this test in many, many places. And even linguists, linguists sometimes get it right, but most audiences don't. Which two were written by the computer? Take a stroke. Number four. Number four was written by a computer, and? Oh, two, so you have to do, and we come up against the problem of translation, is we program these computers. So, which one? Uh, the four, so you can see the top one still mid, so you're saying four, I love and fear him. 
Yeah, I said four. Four, and um, just pick one more, and then I'll tell you the answer. Two. Yeah. Okay, two was written by a computer. Okay, now, 50%, three, two, three, four, that means there's no surety. And this is why I think technologies are useful to study to the extent that they mimic or confuse human thinking. So the, the answer, in so there is a correct answer, but it's not important because, it, so, so the answer is four and one were written by human beings and two and three were written by a computer. Why? Because you can program computers to recognize that iteration, repetition, is important in poetry. You can program computers to say, use words like midnight and sea and thunder. These are evocative words. They are poetic words. And I have several. So I've developed several tests like this. And, uh, and I would actually like to put these tests out because it shows how complex is linguistic cognition and how the tests don't have to be boring. They can be interesting in leading to theoretical uh, advances. I'm just giving you one, but I have one on conversation, for example. Um, so now we talk about, so we can say there are new intersubjective genres being produced, SMS and you know, interactive writing of all sorts, emails, etc. We have to see whether these are full-fledged art forms. If they are not, why are they not? And so it is this, so we have intersubjectivity. So these are jokes we have in class. If Anna Karenina had a cell phone, would Tolstoy's novel really have been 800 pages long? because we live in the age of SMS. So it's so English, English, and we have the last one, which is, I think, a New Yorker cartoon, which is a mother telling her child, no, you weren't down downloaded, you were born. So we have shifted uh, things. So now we come to research methods, because I've laid out some kind of a background. Now, so now, method. How many of you, I just want to ask, have been to research methods, workshops, or have come across them? Nobody? Yes? No? One, two? So all the IITs have this as a compulsory core course. Qualitative research methods and quantitative research methods. They are core to anybody wanting to do a PhD. But I have been suspicious of research methods courses because I feel that they are not strongly enough linked to theory. So that's where we should be building our resources. And uh, pragmatics has very good methods and a good links to theory. So when I went on internet and I just did a very quick search, I found like I, my mind was going absolutely haywire, but there were these hundreds of terms associated with research methodology. And I found it very hard to sort out what was relevant, what was not relevant, and I was very confused. It took me time. I, and I thought, you know, I've spent my life doing this and I'm confused as to what would be appropriate research methodology. Would it be too narrow? Would it answer fundamental questions? Would it not? What would it do? And I saw we'd moved far away from a paradigm where we had these disciplines like literary studies, philosophy, thing. because when I went online, my head was being messed with. There was too much there. There was an explosion of information. So then I thought to myself, well, you know, what they're trying to do in the IITs is they've coined this term STEM. You know this term STEM? Science, technology, engineering, and math. Okay, so it's all the world. Everyone knows STEM, so I said, you know, we should add LEAF to it which is liberal education in the humanities uh, faculties, um, in um, something like that, whatever it was, and um, liberal education in the arts fields. And um, this is a more organic metaphor, to my mind, than the metaphor we use now in current syntax, which is interface areas, which is quite a mechanical metaphor. So I'm suggesting that we use petty old areas, but this is trivial because it's semantics, but still. 
So, uh, so the question was, if you have a long list like that, and lists are only useful as a first device, how would you transform it into a, a set of practices? Which terms are central, which are peripheral, what patterns of coherence are made, etc. And um, is the demand for new research methods really sort of riding roughshod over the questions we want to ask. So that's my fundamental question. I wanted to talk about Paul Feyerabend because he wrote this famous book, Against Method. And one of the points he made was that being methodo methodical is not the same thing as being rational. And there is nothing intrinsically rational about the methods of science. And that's where you get the continuum between stem and leaf, between science and the methods of the human sciences. So Paraben's point was that if you keep saying, oh, we want method, we want method at the cost of everything else, then one of the things is you're really not being rational. You're clinging to a kind of ideology. And that's important for us to realize. So, um, and of course, uh, Chomsky talked about levels of adequacy, which we who know, observational adequacy, where you look at the data, descriptive adequacy, where you have categories like nouns, verbs, etc., which look at the data uh, in um, theoretical terms. And then you seek to explain the data. These links are not very clear when we look at the complex language uh, situation on the ground in India. So theory, research areas, research design, language literature, so these subsume each other. And uh, we are going to skip a bit. We have also have um, on the ground problems, like you said, how to write a research paper. How, now, I was not taught any of this. I kind of learned it by osmosis. But now people want courses which will teach them how to write a paper. So this workshop is not about exactly how to fit your paper in, but how you are to present your ideas. And, uh, and there, so you have all this business about, do you want an MLA style sheet, or do you want some other kind of style sheet? And I think that's all rubbish. Because you can pick up style sheet things in a minute by yourself if you know what you want to say. And then you have problems like plagiarism and competition and lack of originality and all these things which come up in Indian research critiques, Western critiques, when you submit your papers to these boards. And I look at some of the criticisms, they are of this nature. The English isn't sound, the argument isn't sound, they have plagiarized, this is very, there's nothing original about this. So these are not problems you can dismiss. This is why we have to build from the ground up. Um, third part is where I'm going to be talking about language and discourse. And so you know these definitions of language. Um, everybody here now, Oh, not on the right side, but on my left, everybody knows these definitions. So language, now listen, this is Sapir, who is of course a kind of linguistic relativist, and he says language is a purely human and non-instinctive means it's rational, it is cognitive. Um, uh, ways of communicating what? Communicating ideas followed by emotions, which is an area I work in and I'm very interested in taking further, um, and desires, so goals. So look at this description. And then you have a uh, Saussure, that language consists of the general patterns of speech in a speech community, which is an idea which comes up in pragmatics, and the speaking action of an individual in a particular situation. And thirdly, Chomsky's definition, language is an innate capability, right? So these would be some of the many, many trends which we have in um, linguistics. I myself have a pattern which I learned from Den Himes. Den Himes gives you a mnemonic for communication, which is all these things, scene, setting, message form, message content. I can go through these, and I made one for you basically for my students, for what would be the features of language. And you just have to know the word language and you'll remember them. Lexicon, arbitrariness, which 
is a feature we need to talk about. Um, novelty, new sentences, new uh, structures, grammar at the core, usage which we study, and anomalies, problems with language, what happens when language breaks down, something I'm interested in, and uh, growth, development, language development, and emotions. So these, to me, would be the components of a rich theory of language, and you can focus on any one, but you must be aware of the rest of it. So those are the things again. Words, 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 as Shakespeare said, there's nothing good or ill, but thinking makes it so. And thinking is, by and large, although not entirely, a linguistic activity. So Wittgenstein, without language, we could not build roads, we could not communicate, we couldn't do anything. And Salman Rushdie is saying, you know, if you're dealing with scripts and language, you're provoking the imagination. So discourse analysis. Now we come into our field. The term was, I understand, this, uh, this is all known, I'm just summarizing it for you. Uh, came into use, um, first used by Zelig Harris. It came into prominence with a few books in 1981 to 85. Um, and some of the most important of these figures were Tannen, Stubbs, Levinson. So Levinson is not a discourse analyst. He's a pragmatist, but he was included in early studies of, um, and I have to tell you a Levinson story, but we are running out of time, so I don't want to take. And then there are all these definitions of what discourse analysis is, and I don't want to spend too much time on them, but discourse analysis or discourse studies is a general term and covers all this speech act theory, stylistics, and so on. It's quite general, so we have to be able to, in theory and in method, narrow it down. Discourse analysis, Ellen Prince says in the Cambridge History of Survey of Linguistics, discourse analysis is very problematic because it's widely used but loosely defined. At least two reasons for this come to mind. One is a positive one, the other a negative one. The positive one is that discourse and all its aspects is a salient and important object of study in a large number of domains. And she says the Bad, the negative reason for not evaluating discourse analysis so highly is that uh, nothing in discourse analysis has very strong um, theoretical boundaries. You can use terms in this flexible and loose way. And this is a problem which came up yesterday when I was discussing things with you. So it's uh, based, discourse analysis features based, you can study either spoken or written corpora. You can uh, it is a contextualized study. All these things are said about pragmatics as well. The units of analysis are usually larger than a sentence. And uh, you look at the ground between sentence and utterance, and uh, you have a focus on uh, on the constructions of the subject, etc. We can talk about all this later in more detail. Now I've done something wrong. Okay. Okay. Then we have all the cousins of discourse analysis: conversational analysis, stylistic analysis, speech act theory, pragmatics, narrative analysis. I might not go into all this in great detail, although I have the slides. I can give them to you. Um, conversational analysis is absolutely a key methodology, a key ideology in as everyone here will tell you, they are very, I mean, Jeff and uh, Jenny and Dianola are very familiar, and also Deepti, uh, who works on repair, among other things. But the rest of you may not know this. So we'll have to think about this methodology as very central to microanalysis, to doing details of analysis across languages. And in there, so for my IIT students, when they're mixing languages, at what point are they mixing languages and repairing the utterance which they often do? There are hundreds of good questions which we haven't asked. They're based on um, tape recordings and videos and so on. But um, ultimately, I think, and you can comment on this, Jenny, is that um, 
Once you make your transcript, it's the transcript you work from, not the original video. So you have to have skills at making transcripts. You have all this terminology, turn, turn allocation, sequences, repairs, gaps and silences, laughter, clapping. You can analyze all of this. Okay, so we'll, we'll talk about this a little later. I mean, I'm, this is a summary. Goffman, Sachs, Gumpertz, Jefferson, lots of, there's a good lineup. He's not really a... No, but his dates are wrong. Okay. The yeah, but this is when they, they started up. It's not. No, because oh. then the mm. date was too long. Okay, so they anyway, so we put, we'll, we'll extend him. Never He's Jenny's husband. Likewise, for Shekel, I mean, never mind. Never mind. Yes, yes. Okay. Yeah, so roughly, I'm talking about starting up dates, so maybe, you know, I'm or ending. When they begin or when they end? So, no, roughly when they began, 50s, 60s, and not till the end because, you know, they peaked in some ways, then other well, schools came in, etc. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, so there's that as well. So, so Goffman, for example, yes. died quite young. Yes, the, uh, young. Mm. Yeah, so. So we have, so I'm not doing life histories here, so there will be things where I'm not looking at great detail, but roughly giving you dates from the 60s on. And uh, pragmatics, again, 50s, J.L. Austin, Paul Grice, 60s, John Searle, 60s right up to now, and Levinson. Levinson, I want to say, was writing pragmatics and I was his PhD student and he used to type on these, um, he, he used to type and they it used to come out on those cyclo styles sheets which we've had very faint, I don't even know if you've seen them, those streets, those things which come out in rolls from the computer, you know, and he used to tell me, you know, we read this stuff, and I said, no, it's so ugly, and it's so unesthetic, I can't bear to read this stuff, because it would come out, and I, that was my mistake, because I could have contributed at least something from our domain, and I didn't, and I was his PhD student, and I remember him as he said, telling me, you know, read this reams of stuff, and I just didn't have the appetite to read it, because that was not my idea of a book, but it turned out to be a foundational text in pragmatics and I'm glad I was there when Stephen was writing it. So uh, so we all have stories and dates and whatnot. <laughs> so um, um, then we have stylistics which we have all the way down to now uh, from Jakobsen onwards where Many people are familiar with stylistics like feel, tenor, mode. The problem with us is how we are to bring together these fields and find the most useful interdisciplinary applications of this method um, in order to understand our text better. And we have so many of them, so many of them also uh, not with, with mixed language content. And I wanted to talk more about implicature, entailment, presupposition, and Gricean stuff. I'll do that in my next talk. And speech act theory two, I will talk about in my lecture, and especially the classes of speech acts like declaratives and directives, and what is the difference between, let's say, a representative and a declarative, and so on, and why these are claimed to be building blocks of language. So, um, when we come to um, stylistics, we have all these emotive, aesthetic, conative. What I find is there's a lot of overlap, but people who do semiotics don't necessarily talk to the pragmaticians and so on. So, uh, in India, we are not bound by any of this, so we can take from anybody we want. And um, I well, myself work on narrative. This brings me to the last part of my lecture. I'll just introduce narrative and then do a more thorough lecture later. Uh, I want you to look at the data. <coughs> I worked a lot with single sentence analyses, uh, stories, narratives, because I felt that you could look at inference making very clearly 
in this. And um, uh, I don't know whether any of you know the root of the word cognition, do you? Do you know where it comes from? So it's related to the Sanskrit word jnana, and it comes, so cognition comes from the Greek word for gnomon, which is a sundial. Do you know what a sundial is? Yes, it's, it's a device to measure time. So you have an aggregate of physical objects, like a pole, a shadow on the ground, and the position of the sun. And from this, you measure what is essentially an abstract quantity, time, which you can't see, which you can't hold, you can't touch, but you know it exists. And so measuring time and creating abstract concepts are done by a sort of aggregating of inferences from the ground. So inference making is very important in my mind to many contextualized theories and that means that you have to look at how one makes inferences. In this case I'm looking at narrative inferences. So this is a Bangla story. It says Akta Bagh, Akta Shikari, Akta Bagh. Okay? A tiger, a hunter, a tiger. It's very minimalist. What happens at the end of this story? You have to infer. You've just been given three images. And you're asked to, so this is a story. It has to have an ending. What is the end of this story? The tiger ate the hunter. The the hunter. And we are able to infer this without literal meaning. That is, we get non-natural meaning. We get extra meaning, Gricean meaning, from this. And so the question really is, how do we infer it? And we do it so quick, quicker than a computer. And so for me, narrative was a means of looking at inferences and also at emotions. Because I said to myself, hey, you know, here you are with all these discourse forms like stories and poetry, and I write myself, so I'm in, in sort of invested in this. How is it that they have lasted for thousands of years when they are not the most direct means of conveying information? If you want to say that a tiger ate a hunter after they confronted you, why do you just, just say akta bag, akta shikari, akta bag? And my answer was that uh, when you watch a good movie or a film or anything like that, your palms will sweat your pulse rate will go up, your eyes will fixate, and yet you know this is false. It's not true. So I concluded that it was, or, or an evolutionary hypothesis could be, that this was a very cheap means, an epistemic means, of getting emotionally charged information which you would record in your memory without actually having to climb a cliff. Because if you actually had to climb a cliff to experience fear or fall down a hole, this would be very species expensive. So storytelling is actually quite a cheap epistemic means of holding the emotion in there and holding the inferential patterns in there and giving you rationality in thought. That was my hypothesis and that was what narrative gravity was about. Now we come to the second story for which you require more cultural knowledge. Who's heard of John Donne here? Inglit? Okay, who's John Donne? He was a poet. When? He was a metaphysical poet, right. And so he married the, he was a tutor to Anne Dunn, whom he married. He's describing their affair. And what happens? So he says, John, and, John Dunn, Anne Dunn, undone. And that's lovely because it plays on rhythm, it plays on memory, and it gives you the story of love in three brief structures. And you will remember it. And this is one way, an important way of learning about things like fear and danger and love and 
keeping them there as part of a structure of interaction. So this would be one of my arguments about narrative. Um, and uh, so I'll skip the other one. There are hundreds of them, so I'll give you lots. Um, okay, so uh, now if we look at language and the evolution of language, uh, let's see whether you agree with this. We are linguistic beings. Are we linguistic beings? Yes. yes, because obviously this is claimed to be one of the main characteristics of human being. I think the other one is actually technology or tool using. One, and today in the 21st century, language and tool using technologies have come together in very powerful ways, which is why we need these methods of analysis. So we are linguistic beings, but we live in a world of sensation and perception. And so we have to constantly interpret through our language the sensations, perceptions, feelings, and emotions. For example, you're still looking at the screen. So I'm just judging that you're not as bored as you could be because I've given you visual sensation there. Right? In addition to my not so charming voice, right? So uh, you have uh, all of this, and language enables us to organize all this flux and give it rationality but also emotion. So this is why language analyses are important. So, and it took a long time for this to happen. So we can be looking at 200 to 100,000 years for larger brains, for bipedalism, for all the hardware to come into, uh, to come into uh, the, come into our heads. The, you know, a lot of hardware which we also need to study and phoneticians and phonologists don't study this nearly as much. Um, then we have about 50 to 30,000 years ago so I'm not telling you anything new. You can look at the birth of language in many journals. Uh, you have what is called the social explosion of language. What ha this is when you start arguing, you get recursive structures, you get um, sort of rep, uh, rep, uh, interactive representations, but writing, this is the point I want to make to you. India is one of the oldest, one of the oldest, not the oldest, writing civilizations in the world and it spread very quickly but linguists often say or at least I say having looked at the data that language came in the 11th hour, uh, script came in the 11th hour, that it came right at the end, it's only some people say 5,000, I say seven or 8,000 years but not longer, that's a very short time compared to a 50,000 year period. So when we're looking at writing, it's still a relatively recent and fairly unstable invention and may be replaced by television and other forms which give you or, or um, internet information which gives you undying forms of record. So we have to look at this phenomenon as well. Again, I think pragmatics offers us um, good tools to do this. Um, so, we'll come to language and cognition or narrative cognition. I've told you what I think cognition is. Uh, he says we are storytelling creatures. What we do, what we use language for is to tell stories. We are programmed, he says, to create stories. Now, let's see whether you agree with this hypothesis. Uh, I don't know whether you agree. I tend to agree. Uh, but I'm not sure and we can never be sure. Um, uh, the others, so uh, we won't, so basically I want to end with a, maybe a couple more things with Labov. Labov uh, did, I believe, a very useful service to theorists who approach analysis, uh, you know, Foucault has written about discourse analysis, but who approached the analysis of narrative through linguistic means. And what Labov did is that he looked at danger of death stories among um, 
I think, a population of black youth. And uh, what he found was the danger of death stories, according to him, in ordinary everyday discourse. We should be looking at danger of death stories because we have a lot of them in India, in the public sphere and also uh, elsewhere. Have these uh, six components, abstract, orientation, um, complicating action, evaluation, and resolution, and coda. Now, of these, the central one is what? He said you only one of these elements is absolutely critical. Complicating action, that's right. So you don't need resolution. Many, many modern stories don't have resolution. They may have no place or time or when or where. But you do need something happening the tiger ate the hunter, or a ghost story in one sentence. A man woke up in the dark, groped for his matches, and felt them put into his hand. Why is it a ghost story? Because the heading tells you this is a ghost story, so your wife didn't put it into your hand. Many hypotheses go out of the bed, and you get fear as the emotion generated. So we are always, particularly in political discourse, as I will try to show you when we're looking at verbal and nonverbal uses of language in the public sphere, play with structure and logic and argument, but also with emotion. And they ask you to make inferences very quick. So you could make mistakes, but so these are the, I, and I can explain these elements to you backwards, but I won't do so, so as to leave Jenny some time. Um, so when I first read Aristotle, now how many of you do Aristotle as part of your courses? English literature again? Okay, so uh, you know, I always teach Aristotle even to my engineering students because he's written on ethics as well as uh, poetics. And he said, well, you know, I'll give you a definition of a story, a narrative. It must have a beginning, a middle, and an end. And I thought, that's stupid. I mean, why is he stating the obvious? A table has a beginning, a middle, and an end. Why is he saying this? And then I began to look at these short narratives, and what I found is, Look at this illustration. I'll tell you a story of Jack and Nori, and now my story's begun. I'll tell you another of Jack and his brother, and now my story is done. It rhymes. It has everything. What's wrong with it? According to Aristotle's definition. It doesn't have a middle. It has a classic philosopher's dilemma. It has an excluded middle. Excluded middles will not give you OK narratives. And so I began to see that there was wisdom in tracking back the narrative path, in looking at how stories might have evolved. And although I worked out of speech act theory and all the rest of it, I really uh, feel that there's a lot more work to be done, especially in India, on narrative analysis. So I won't talk about Aristotle. We can talk about later. So I think that we have moved in narrative history. Just as we look at history itself, we can look at narrative history in terms of the idea of catharsis. So you know what Aristotle said is essentially you tell this dramatic story, and then you purge the emotions of pity and fear, and you have calm of mind. Okay, that's to summarize badly, but that's Aristotle's theory. It's catharsis. You get purged. I think we've moved to the idea of stories where crisis, anxiety, fear, irritation is paramount. And your whole narrative structure can be built out of emotions like boredom and so on, because it's a kind of emotional crisis. So we don't have these great emotions, maybe. We've moved from uh, this dreaming narratives to depression narratives. And I've seen this happen in these 30 years among my students. When I first went to IIT 25 years ago, my students hardly knew the word depression. Now there is not a single story, a single student in my undergraduate class who doesn't talk about depression as, as part of his everyday narrative. 
This change has happened. This is how words influence the way in which you think about yourself as a person. Right? So we do know that you put the word depression there and you move from this dreaming scenario to a depression scenario and from mimesis, which Aristotle spoke about, um, which is the idea that you imitate actions in order to show things as they could be or as they ought to be, to the idea of memes. And I want to talk about memes because, do you know about memes? How many of you go on the internet and know about memes? Do you know what memes are? Internet memes? What are they? So these are examples of memes. What are they? They are ideas that touch cross-cultural boundaries very quickly. And of course on the internet they do so very. So these are some of their examples. And these are some Indian memes which I made up. So the sari zero is an Indian meme, it's across the world, etc. And memes are useful because they are transmissions of ideas through language and visual impressions. So, uh, so I won't talk about literature today, um, but let me see. Um, I, want to talk, I want to end by talking about the idea of theory and how narratives, to my mind, were the first type of theory because they described the world, they interpreted the world, they said, you know, why the squirrel has spots or whatever it is. And um, so you do have um, the idea that uh, you are able to kind of um, use narrative as a kind of theoretical device in cultures which do not have the standard resources of theory. So I think one should be looking at narrative as theory. We have lots of types of post-colonial theory and other ones. Um, but I want to talk about theory as a language which is embedded in narrative. And if we look at the questions of what are theory, we can come back to these. We can, I have begun to make a typology of theories and this is important for me because this is where I want to end. We have traditionally in science explanatory theories. They explain phenomena in the world. We have theories in literature which elaborate what was the meaning of the text and then we have what I call ecumenical theories which seek to deal in oughts and shoulds. They tell us what you ought to do. And those are like religious narratives and so on. Finally, we have post-colonial theory, emancipatory theories. And these kinds of, they are all narratives, but they're different types of narratives and the goals of these narratives are different. So maybe we need to make a link in my field, which I want to look at narrative and literary forms. Um, and without going into technical stuff, I want to say that we should maybe make a link in the middle range that is between explanatory type theories, uh, exploratory theories, and emancipative theories without looking at shoulds or oughts, which used to be called prescriptive theory. And I think I might, so, so now, are we going backwards? So, yes. So I want to say that all, so this is something which happened to me. That's the last slide. I was in London and I think one thing which Aristotle says and which Lebov also says is that in any story, people are asking you, well, what's the point of your story? Why are you telling me this? And he says it's always relevant to tell a danger of death story, but it's not relevant to tell a boring story about how you brushed your teeth and went to class and then went to sleep. And he says, and Aristotle also says, that uh, and Indian theories, Abhigyana uh, theories also say, at the heart of a theory, of a story, you must have a shock of recognition. This could happen to me. Abhigyanam, recognition, recognition. And I, it, this happened to me like I was walking down a path in London, which was very familiar to me. It was by the Thames. And suddenly I looked down, and I don't know why I looked down. And at the bottom, I saw writing, I saw a script at my feet. And I said, What is this? And I looked at it, and they were lines from T.S. Eliot. 
and they would describe the Thames, but they were engraved in the ground, as you can see. It's about, um, uh, what is it? The river sweats, the tar, and, uh, and there's the heavy drifting of logs on the bridge. So, and to find Eliot at my feet in script on the banks of the Thames, just because I happened to look down at that moment, it was a shock of recognition. I said, I know this narrative. This narrative is from English literature. The Thames is a trope in English literature. And so I think this notion that language gives you not only rational knowledge about the world, not even theoretical knowledge about the world, but it actually gives you a way, a, a shock of recognition, a self-recognition. That is, uh, to me, one of the critical points of all kinds of discourse. So I'll stop there and hand over to Jenny. Thank you.